Here are the top 10 good and bad things about the 2023 Subaru Outback XT, in my opinion. Let's get stuck into the good stuff. Number 10. So Subaru has been making the Outback now since 1994. That means it's coming up to its 30th anniversary next year. And with heritage comes experience. Subaru knows what it's doing when it comes to this style of vehicle. You also know what you're going to get. If someone mentions to you Subaru Outback, you immediately know it's a jumped up wagon, kind of adventurous, it can go off road, but it can also take on all, all sorts of weather. Number nine. The Outback is based on the Subaru Liberty or Legacy if you're watching from overseas, and it is just raised up a bit. Subaru is one of the pioneers of this vehicle style, arguably the pioneer. So it's a station wagon that's jumped up a bit, it can go off-road, it's a bit rugged. It's got this black plastic cladding on the side there for a sort of scratch resistance and some more down below. But it also offers decent ground clearance. So compared with the last Subaru Liberty that was sold in Australia, I think it was 2020 when it was cancelled, it offered, the sedan offered 150 millimeters of ground clearance, whereas this has 213 millimeters. And with the Outback being based on a station wagon, there are none of the compromises that you have to deal with, or you might have to deal with, with a more heavy duty style SUV, such as this has fully independent suspension, front and rear. It's also got conventional style tires. They're not gonna be expensive or as expensive to replace compared with full all-terrain tires. And it doesn't drive like a truck. It drives like a normal station wagon or sedan. Number eight. Although it is a bit sad to see the flat six engine go from the top of the range outback, this new turbo, or well, it's not actually that new, but it is for Australia, FA24 turbo. This is basically a Subaru WRX engine that's detuned a little bit to 183 kilowatts and 350 newton meters. Before this came along, only a 2.4 naturally aspirated flat four was offered. So it's nice to have a flagship engine again. Number seven. Subaru vehicles are always very well made in my experience. And the interior of the new Outback in this sport variant is no different. This example has the green stitching to indicate its adventurous side, but the seat trim it's got this kind of, it's not leather, but it's kind of a soft waterproof style trim. It all feels really nice, it feels really soft as well. Even extends to the dashboard there. And the upper dash has kind of got this rubbery stuff. So there's hardly any of that nasty scratchy plastic in here. Even the lower part of the doors, it is plastic, but it's, it's kind of thick and it just feels a bit more premium than a typical vehicle in this segment. These seats are also very comfortable and soft. So it can support long journeys with no trouble. Passenger space is also very good. I've got plenty of headroom and legroom is great. And again, it feels like a conventional station wagon. It doesn't feel like I'm sitting in a big truck. If you do want a sort of raised up driving position, you might want to check out some of the rivals, which are definitely feel a bit higher than this. But yeah, this feels like a conventional sedan that's just raised up a little bit. Number six, wireless Android Auto and Android Android Android. Basically, these car connectivity systems display a number of your phone apps right onto the screen. So I've got a music system here, I've got Plug Share, which tells me where the nearest charges are for electric vehicles, but also Google Maps and your messages. You can configure what apps you want to show on here. Not all apps on your phone are compatible with uh, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, but it is good to have that on the screen, so you don't have to worry about digging around on your phone. Number five. It's not the best touchscreen in, in its class, in my opinion, just in terms of functionality and intuitiveness, but it is nice and big. It's 11.6 inches, vertical orientation or portrait style orientation. And it's just, yeah, it's a much better than previous uh, Subaru systems. You've just got some apps there laid out, so it's very simple. You can jump to the, the car settings, and you've got all the, the vehicle settings and your phone settings. It also comes with Siri voice command and digital radio. And I like the way that it's got some main functions separate to the screen. So you can quickly adjust the temperature, change the, the volume on the radio with a knob just there. And then these climate main climate settings are down here. So that kind of stays there all the time. If you click the one of the climate buttons, it'll come up with the full settings. Number four. Let's have a look. 
The Outback is always known for its practicality and the boot space is perfect for both active lifestyles and busy families. Firstly, you have 522 litres available in the standard configuration. You can fold down the rear seats and they go completely flat, which makes it great for you know, carrying surfboards and long bits of furniture or something like that. The loading height is also pretty low, so you don't have to worry about lifting things over the, the edge of the bumper bar there. And you can also fold down the rear seats from these pull tabs on the sides. And you've also got a 12 volt socket down there so you can connect up some accessories. Number three, and this is an important one, a full size spare wheel. Under the boot here, under the boot floor, sorry, you'll find the full size alloy spare wheel. In my opinion, any SUV that boasts any sort of off-road capability needs a full-size spare wheel, especially in Australia. We've got a big country here. If you're doing some long distance touring, the last thing you want to do is fit a space saver spare wheel on the car. Number two, off-road capability. So with 213 millimeters of ground clearance, that is quite good. It's not great compared with some of the ladder frame style SUVs in this specific class, but for a wagon, it is definitely very good. I've taken these things off-road quite a few times and they performed surprisingly well in pretty rough conditions as well. The Outback also offers those tall sidewall tires. They provide plenty of give, especially on sort of rough dirt roads or corrugated roads. And unlike some SUVs and crossovers in this class, the Outback offers a full-time all-wheel drive system, not like an on-demand system where it's mainly front-wheel drive and then the back, it will send power to the, to the back wheels if it needs to. This is running a constant all-wheel drive system, although it can distribute torque to wheels that have more traction. Again though, if you're after hardcore off-roading, you are better off looking elsewhere, but compared with other crossovers and wagon style SUVs, the Outback definitely comes up near the top or at the top of the class, in my opinion. And then the number one good thing about the Subaru Outback, in my opinion, is the safety. So not only with all wheel drive, that provides a good level of safety, especially in wet weather. This comes with all kinds of sensors and cameras, forward vision cameras there, as well as a camera on the front of the vehicle. And there are even cameras and sensors inside the vehicle that can warn you if it looks like you're being distracted or tired. All right, we've heard the good things about the Outback. What are the bad? Number 10, boxer engine drinks oil. So Subaru engines use what's called a flat configuration or boxer of configuration of engine, uh, where the, whereby the pistons are basically shooting side by side instead of up and down. Flat or boxer engine types are known to drink a little bit of oil to the point where there have been class action lawsuits against Subaru for excessive consumption in the USA, of course. Without getting too technical, the root of the potential problem seems to be the way the pistons lie on their sides when it's stopped. I've heard reports of the piston rings wearing unevenly due to the way the piston is sitting on its side when it's stopped. Then you start it up and it gets that sort of initial scrape on the side. Do that quite a few times and you're gonna wear the, well you can wear that side of the piston ring. That's what's been reported anyway. Subaru has employed a number of revisions to its engines over the years to help rectify this potential issue. Number nine, now this can potentially link to number 10, servicing intervals. In Australia, Subaru suggests servicing intervals of every 12 and a half thousand kilometers or every 12 months, whichever comes first. As a former mechanic myself, I think that's just a bit too much. I'd rather service a vehicle every 10,000 kilometers or even less if it's a performance engine, uh, particularly with something like this that is known to drink a little bit of oil. I'd be wanting to get that bonnet up a bit more regularly than 12,000 kilometers or every 12 months. Number eight. So the official average of this particular model is nine liters per 100 kilometers, which is not, in my opinion, all that great, especially for the amount of power this engine produces, 183 kilowatts and 350 newton meters. It's not a hugely powerful engine. So nine liters per 100 is a little bit high, just in, the, in terms of the official, rate, uh, official numbers. I've averaged so far 
I've had it now for almost a week. So 8.4 is a little bit more like it. It's actually good to see a lower number than the official rating. I don't know how I've managed to do that, but yeah, 8.4. I have been driving it a lot on the highway and sort of open roads in the country. If you drive a bit more in the city or built up areas, that is definitely going to climb a bit higher than that. Instead of me just telling you my opinion though, here's a list of vehicles that offer similar or more power, have a similar weight and feature all wheel drive, yet offer better official fuel economy or at least the same fuel economy, but offer heaps more power. Number seven, we're back in the boot because on paper, 522 liters of capacity is not all that impressive for this specific class of vehicle. But I think the problem lies in what vehicle class this sits in in Australia, because it's listed according to VFAX as a large SUV. So that means it goes up against the likes of the Toyota Prado, Ford Everest, an Isuzu MUX, but this is based on a conventional sedan. So it shouldn't really, in my opinion, be that category of vehicle. It should be classed as a mid-size SUV. Nonetheless, I have to compare it officially. So 522 liters does fall down short on many of those larger SUVs. Number six, while we're back here actually, again, because this is classed as a large SUV, I have to compare it officially to those vehicles that do have seven seat options. And yeah, in Australia, the Outback doesn't come with seven seats. I don't think it comes with seven seats anywhere in the world actually. And in Australia, there is no seven seat option at all in, in Subaru's showroom. I know overseas does offer a seven seater, but nothing in Australia is available. I think Subaru Australia is missing an opportunity there because seven seat SUVs in Australia are quite popular. Number five. So I'm just going to straight out say this, I hate CVT gearboxes. I think they're a quick fix solution to a fuel economy and, you know, they bring down, immediately bring down the fuel economy by, you know, 0.8 or 1 litre per 100 kilometres straight away. As soon as you just put that, a CVT gearbox matched up to an engine, just straight away reduces the fuel economy, fuel consumption, sorry. I think Subaru has fit a, or invested in CVTs purely because of that and just chucked it in every single model that it has almost. In my opinion though, they're clearly not designed for any kind of driving enthusiast, even mild driving enthusiasts that like to just go for a drive on a Sunday for something to do. The CVT is just so far from anything enthusiastic, it's just, yeah, it's not even funny. For a small city run around, sure, a CVT makes sense. It doesn't matter, you don't care about, you know, going through the gears and all that sort of sensation. You're just running about in the city. But in a big touring wagon like this, I would like to see a seven or eight speed conventional automatic. Another point though, CVTs generally don't provide engine braking. So if you change down the gears, it does have a manual mode here. It's even got paddle shifters ambitiously. I don't see the point in those at all. Generally, CVTs work by managing the ratio according to what speed you're dri driving and keeping the optimum revs for maximum efficiency. But what it means is the engine just sort of moans and, and, and whinges at sort of a certain RPM level, two or 3,000 RPM, and it just stays there until you get up to speed. It's just not very inviting, it's not very encouraging, and most of all, it's just not fun. It doesn't seem fun to drive a CVT gearbox in, you know, sort of any sort of mildly spirited road. Number four. So yes, it is great that Subaru has fit a flagship engine for its flagship models, but on paper, the figures just aren't that impressive. I remember about 10 years ago, the Ford Falcon came out with a, or it might've been a bit longer than that. It came out with a two liter turbo four cylinder and it produced 180 kilowatts and 350 Newton meters or thereabouts. So for the new-ish, 2.4 engine, this engine has been around for a few years now overseas, the FA24. For it to have 183 kilowatts from a 2.4 litre, so that's 400 cc's of extra capacity, and only 350 newton meters, it's just not that impressive. The Mazda has the 2.5 turbo petrol in its 
CX9, which produces 420 Newton meters. So a 2.4 should at least, yeah, be on 400 Newton meters. In terms of performance though, I have timed 0 to 100 in 7.3, I think it was, with the old channel, with this car. So the performance is, it's okay. And look, I know performance and power isn't everything, but there comes a point where you're stacking it up against its rivals, choosing what, what vehicle to buy. You just see the figures of this and they just don't stand out when they should stand out. It should be more powerful and it should offer more torque, especially for that fuel consumption figure. On the other hand though, being classed as a large SUV does give Subaru an advantage because it means it is kind of one of the quickest or one of the quicker models in this specific class up against things like the Ford Everest, Toyota Prado, For Toyota Fortuner, things like that. This thing is quicker. Number three, in my opinion, it's, it handles okay. The, the, the platform feels good, but there is a bit of body roll. The steering feels a bit soft and doughy. And I think the tall profile tires contribute a bit there too. It's just not as exciting to drive through the bends as some rivals. And specifically, I'm talking about crossover rivals, not the big heavy duty SUV rivals. What it does mean though, is the Outback does provide good ride comfort, even on dodgy country roads. Yeah, it just soaks up the bumps really well. Number two. Yes, I know I said this touchscreen is good, so compared with T Subaru's previous systems, but it can be just a little bit overwhelming, and I think some of the menu avenues are kind of dead end. You've got the vehicle settings here, and it takes you to a separate menu, and then you've, you can scroll across as well. You've still got the radio up the top there, and you've still got the climate down, the, down below here. It just can become a bit overwhelming and a bit confusing, at least initially. Like all things though, you know, you just get used to it. But I think with this system, it's going to take you a bit longer to get used to than some of the rival setups, in my experience anyway. So I'm jumping in and out of a new vehicle every week pretty much, or even multiple per week. So I only get to have that first impressions experience. You as an owner, you're going to get used to this and you're going to think that it's great. And that, that's fair enough. I'm just saying in terms of jumping in and out of different vehicles, first impressions are that it is a little bit overwhelming. Some of the menus and things, they just seem a bit not in, not as intuitive as they they can be the instrument cluster though is pretty clean it's got good old analog dials on the sides there and then a main menu system right in the middle and you can go through and change the different displays so that that's not too bad it's a little bit small up the top there it's it's hard to to see what what's going on there but yeah i find that that's a bit more acceptable, but yeah, the, the main touchscreen here, they probably could just have a better layout for this. And then the number one bad thing about the Subaru Outback, in my opinion, are the intrusive safety systems. So as I mentioned, this has a massive array of all sorts of safety sensors and cameras to try and keep you safe, but I feel like some of them are a bit over the top. For example, I have yawned while driving uh, this vehicle on a few occasions and a warning came up on the dash saying something like, pay attention to the road. I'm yawning, you know, are you really saving my life by telling me that I've just yawned? I don't think so. And if anything, having all these warnings and buzzers going off, it's actually a distraction right there. So the first time it happened to me, I yawned and the, the car beeped at me and I was, what have I done? And I looked around, took my eyes off the road for a second, and I realized, oh, you're not paying attention. So it's, it's kind of, yeah, a double-edged sword there where it's, it's trying to save you, but at the same time, it's, it's causing a distraction in the first place. The lane keep assist is also, it's not as intrusive as some of the systems out there it is does seem like a pretty good calibration but it will intervene if you if you get close to the lane uh you know you're driving up a mountain road or something like that you don't want to go on the wrong side of the road but if you're going on the on the outside of the corner and your wheel just gets closer to the the outside lane marking than the inside lane marking it notices that difference and it'll pull you back in and it's just a bit sort of unnerving at first while you're driving. I guess this is a more of a personal opinion of mine. I just don't like this autonomous or semi-autonomous zone we're in at the moment. If you wanna be full autonomous, 
fine, that's fine. But sometimes I've been frustrated with these sorts of systems, not just in the Subaru, but you just want to get out and say, you know, you drive then. If, if, you, if you think you're going to take control of the vehicle, then just you drive. I don't want to be part of this. Again, though, this is my opinion, and these sorts of systems are a great initiative. So they, they're, they're focused on the, on the right thing. They're focused on safety. So that's, that's all good. But just for me, I, I think they need a bit more calibration in terms of real-world driving. There we go, guys. The good and the bad of the Subaru Outback. Have I missed something? Please comment and let me know. And if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.